All right, with that, I think we're ready to get started. So again, my name is Greg Reiske, and I'm very grateful that you're with us on this evening's call. Uh, Furthering this Diversity is the name of our program, and the essential story here is not so much a, a how to conduct uh, a native plant garden or how to prepare a native uh, plant garden. It's more about why to. So we'll be looking at some of the, uh, some of the theory behind native plant use and uh, share a few successes and uh, a few cautionary tales. As soon as I can get my slides to advance. Uh, just a few quick acknowledgements. Uh, some of the organizations that were engaged in some of the projects that uh, we're going to look at during the slideshow um, and some resources. Um, so notably the Wild Ones and uh, I expect that many of you are members of that organization uh, and a number of the local chapters here in southern Wisconsin. So uh, Wild Ones uh, are a good resource for um, advice and guidance on use of native plants in the landscape, as is the Wildflower Preservation and Propagation Committee, which uh, is similar to the Wild Ones chapters uh, operating uh, just across the state line in McHenry County, Illinois. Um, I borrowed some uh, tips and ideas from the Habitat Project at YardMap Org, uh, which is a, a function of Cornell University uh, and the Nature Conservancy and the National Science Foundation. And it's worth noting that this uh, presentation was originally delivered to um, the Illinois Garden Clubs uh, about two years ago. So the subtitle of the presentation is how the use of native R's could undermine our efforts to garden for wildlife, for biodiversity, and for conservation. So we take our cues from nature. Um, I think all of us feel that uh, there's a tremendous beauty and uh, elegance and uh, inspiration in the natural world. So we take a look at what's out there in the wild. And we think, how can we apply that uh, in our home landscape or elsewhere? So when we look at nature, we get ideas for what we might want to do in our own spaces. Nature becomes our design model. Uh, and we become co-creators when we start installing native plants uh, gardening has always been an act of creation. And if we can partner with nature rather than work against nature, uh, we may be far more successful in, uh, in ways that we design and in ways that are, um, that are just by chance. But our prairies and our woodlands uh, are no longer out there in the same abundance that they were once upon a time. Uh, instead, these areas have stunningly undergone a shocking transition from the natural diversity of the past to the sterility of our modern built environment. So we find that we have impermeable surfaces everywhere, pavement, roofs, and even the lawns themselves are virtually impervious to rainwater. So instead of um, shuttling all of our storm water back into our shallow aquifers and recharging groundwater. Instead, we whisk it away and uh, channel it down the curb, down to the storm sewer, and uh, off the, the land as quickly as possible. So we end up with the landscape that is built today with lollipop trees and barren lawns. It's, uh, it's a cold and sterile environment in many ways. But the lawn aesthetic has really taken over in terms of uh, how uh, people perceive 
um, the ideal landscape to be. They like this lush, vast expanse. Um, but lawn grass has evolved in a very different climate from that where we live today. Uh, and that's why lawns demand constant attention. You know, it's a, a process, a cycle, water, weed, feed, repeat. And quite frankly, I would rather be doing something else with my time. Um, there are other things that I find far more satisfying and gratifying than mowing the lawn or uh, trying to remove every bit of weed from it. So when you take a look at this diagram, which is based on the work of uh, a landscape architect by the name of Heidi Natura, who works in the Chicago area and has a home in Walworth County, um, this is a, a, a beautiful cross section of what a number of prairie plants would look like if you could see a cutaway view. And the point here is that the biomass below the surface of the soil is very often greater than the biomass above ground. Not to mention the fact that the tops of these, these plants will die back in the fall and winter, maybe burned off during fall or spring but the roots remain and they thrive. <clears throat> and as these roots decay, they feed the soil, they build the soil by adding organic content uh, to the mineral parent material that make up our soil. So you have these deeply rooted uh, plants that are indigenous to the area. And way over here on the left, you see turf grass. And it's a couple of inches tall, it's the way we mow it, and the roots go only a couple of inches deep. And this is why I say it is akin to pavement in terms of its capacity to transmit um, storm water and rain back into the soil. Instead, it tends to run off uh, in a near shoot type um, condition. So remember, it's those deep roots that build soil. Now, when we talk about the intersection between ecology and economics, um, this concept of ecosystem services has sort of risen to the, uh, to the top of our conversation in recent years. And I'm one of those people that doesn't particularly believe in trying to frame an environmental argument in terms of economics, because I think when you frame your argument in your opponent's language, you're at a disadvantage. However, I do recognize that when talking to um, certain people, um, you want to be able to meet them where they're at. And referring to ecosystem services as uh, an environmental and economic set of benefits can be a useful way of uh, convincing people of how important the natural environment is. So essentially, we can divide our ecosystem services into four primary functions. Uh, those supporting services, uh, such as uh, you know, the cycling of nutrients and uh, uh, hydrology, uh, provisioning services, you know, where we obtain food and fiber and fuel from nature, uh, regulating services, you know, so where we're storing carbon underground or in, uh, in plant matter, um, where we're providing a, a buffer against a harsher environment uh, by having a stand of, of natural ecological uh, space in between us and uh, the strong wind or the uh, loud noise. And then cultural services. So um, those things that allow us to educate one another, to learn from the natural environment, the beauty we find in the natural world, and the, um, and the environmental ethic that we learn through uh, cooperating with natural systems rather than trying to fight against them.
So ecosystems support wildlife. Um, they provide the space for other organisms to flourish. They provide the food, the water, the shelter. Um, ecosystems help to manage stormwater. You know, they can soak up that three inch rain that we got and hold that flood water and release it slowly so that it doesn't create a flash flood sort of uh, situation. Um, it filters the storm water. Uh, plants have a remarkable capacity to render certain toxic um, substances and pollutants uh, into an inert form that is environmentally benign. And of course, the aesthetics are important. You know, the quality of life and our own inspiration and uh, spiritual enrichment uh, certainly derives in part from the natural world. And we use native plants in the landscape because they evolved here. They have spent millennia growing in these kinds of soils, in this kind of climate. Uh, they have um, met with the pests, the pathogens, and the companion plants and animals that have co-evolved with them. Um, we understand that in the face of climate change, natural areas provide a certain natural resilience, uh, that they are able to adapt to sudden changes in the environment. And part of that is due to the diversity of the plant life that supports a diversity of animal life. It's the whole food web. So the way plants support wildlife is very important. Um, whether it is a, a place of shelter during their migration, a source of food, or, uh, or whether it is the way that wildlife in turn supports plants through uh, pollination and uh, seed dispersal. So our native plant gardens, although they may occupy a relatively small area on the landscape, when taken as a string of pearls, they serve as stepping stones, like a, an archipelago of uh, islands uh, that enable um, the movement of organisms from one natural area to another. So these stepping stones can be very important, even if they're just a postage stamp sized garden in your own backyard. And I think very importantly, a native plant garden represents our own natural heritage. This is the legacy of the land. This is our sense of place. And there's no place like this anywhere else on the planet. It doesn't matter where you go, that place is unique. And we know that there are practical aspects to native plant gardens. Certainly they typically require less watering, less uh, maintenance, um, we don't need to use chemicals, we don't need to fertilize, um, and if we do have to treat uh, insect pests or um, fungal pathogens, um, it can usually be done in a less obtrusive manner. And by using native plants in the garden, we are not uh, proliferating the invasive species that uh, we battle in our natural areas. Many of the uh, invasive species that, uh, that we have to deal with in the area were originally introduced as landscape plants. And we don't honestly know what landscape plant may next escape from the garden to invade natural areas. And we can use our native gardens to be able to educate one another. Um, I like to have conversations with the dog walkers who come by the, the house and admire my garden or are curious about, you know, why it's so dense or uh, so atypical. Uh, it gives me a chance to talk about uh, native plants and how important they are. And I think it's important that we plant native gardens so that we can support those growers that are actually uh, ethically producing native stock for the home landscape. Um, you know, our economy is one of supply and demand. 
And if we don't go to a grower, a nurseryman, a, um, a garden center, and tell them we want a true native plant, um, they're not going to deliver on it. They're going to sell what their suppliers are offering them. But if they hear from the customer, we want this, uh, then they will listen. And of course, there is something exquisite about the beauty of our native plants. Uh, I don't need to go select a showy cultivar from some other continent because I know that there are plants that evolved right here in southeastern Wisconsin that are every bit as beautiful as anything that I can obtain elsewhere. Besides which, the native plants are supporting the other organisms that I also appreciate and love. But when we talk about nativity, when we talk about a native plant, well, you know, what does that mean? Um, you know, it can be argued that none of us as, you know, um, human beings that um, derived from uh, immigrants who came here sometime over the past couple of hundred years, none of us are native to this region. Um, you know, unfortunately, the indigenous people were forced out uh, for the most part some time ago. Uh, so why would we care about native plants and what makes a plant truly native uh, and how long does it have to live in one spot before it's treated as a native? Uh, these are puzzling questions. You know, so what do we mean by native and more importantly, what does that concept mean to us? How can we take that, use it, work with it? Well, when I talk about native and non-native plants, when I talk about invasive species, um, it's a complex set of notions to me. Um, but before we get into the, the uh, details of, of that story, I wanted to make sure we come to terms on some of the um, words that we use when we're talking about it. So um, here's just a quick set of terminology and, and brief explanations for each. Um, a clone is uh, a plant that is a identical to its parent and it was um, uh, and it comes about through uh, not through sexual reproduction but typically through vegetative reproduction and this can happen in nature there are clones such as quaking aspen uh, or smooth sumac those are two of our native plants that reproduce as clones a cultivar on the other hand is um, an artificial uh, breed. It is, it is done deliberately uh, through um, artificial means. And by artificial, I simply mean through the artifice of human action. Um, it doesn't mean it's fake. It just means that it was deliberately done uh, through, through human intervention. A hybrid is, is similar to a cultivar. Um, that is to say, cultivars can generally be considered to be a type of hybrid. Uh, but hybrids often will occur in nature. Uh, for example, our oak trees uh, uh, are species that hybridize uh, prolifically. And in fact, the hybrid between several different oak species pairs are actually formally named because they're identifiable in the field. But when we talk about a native plant, we really mean a plant that is found naturally in this area and uh, without human intervention. Uh, another way of saying it is that this plant that has evolved in this space or has expanded its range into this space without being aided or um, moved by humans. Now the term nativar derives from uh, native cultivar. And the term was coined by a horticulturist, his name is Alan Armitage. And it's a cultivar that derives in part from a native plant. It could be a hybrid or it could be a clove. And here's the, the, here's the rub. It's treated as, technically speaking, the same species as the native. But it has likely been compromised, either genetically or otherwise, and what that means is it may not perform all those same ecosystem services that we talked about. We'll explore what that means here in just a few minutes. 
Now, a plant becomes naturalized when it's been established outside its normal range, uh, but it can reproduce there without intervention. Um, usually that means that it has established itself as um, a well-behaved member of the community, as opposed to something that's truly invasive that is um, run amok in the environment. So a non-native species is one that uh, is growing outside its native region and was artificially introduced, you know, whether that was done on purpose or not. You know, another word for non-native is exotic. So an exotic species is simply a non-native species, one that has been removed from its original habitat and introduced elsewhere. When we refer to an ornamental, we just mean it's a, it's a, a plant that is showy uh, and has been, been selected for those qualities that show well. You know, a synonym for a native species is what we call a straight species, or in the horticulture trade, they use the term. Uh, in natural areas management, we simply refer to them as native. But in horticulture and in, uh, in the nursery trade, they refer to straight species or wild type species. And that simply means that it's not been compromised by crossbreeding or hybridization with, with other uh, plants. Uh, a variety is one step down below a subspecies. And again, there are a lot of taxonomic classification details that we can get into, but this isn't really so much about classifying plants as it is about gardening. So we won't go into a, a lot of discussion about that. So, and again, wild type, uh, repeating just again, a, a synonym for native. Okay, so I started to mention this slide earlier before I uh, got into the, the uh, terms, the glossary, but one way I look at native plants is their relative stability in, in the uh, environment as opposed to invasive plants and their instability. So here you see Culver's root. This is a, a conservative native plant, Veronicastrum virginicum. It, is, um, it shows a certain fidelity to certain kinds of habitats. It'll grow in moist prairies. It'll grow in savannas, uh, but you're not likely to find it in an old field that has been badly degraded. It's typically part of a stable native community. It's a native plant, a true species. At the opposite end of the spectrum, here's uh, one of our bad guys. This is a uh, common buckthorn, Ramnus cathartica. It's a non-native plant and it behaves aggressively in the environment. You, know, you see the clusters of the ripe berries there. Uh, it reproduces prolifically. Uh, it establishes quickly, it grows fast, and it outcompetes a lot of uh, the native plants that may grow around it. Uh, it affects the soils in ways that uh, are a detriment to the reproduction of certain native amphibian species, as well as um, inhibiting the growth of native plants. Now here, you've got common cattail, uh, Typha latifolia. It's a native plant, but under certain circumstances, we can see that it behaves aggressively. It can be invasive in certain environments, even though it is native to this part of the world. One reason it behaves that way is because of alterations in hydrology and soils. So where we see, for example, high nutrient-laden um, silty runoff, um, the overburden that may come from um, sheet erosion off of farm fields where livestock has been held uh, or fertilized uh, crops, um, that creates an unnatural condition that invigorates the cattail and causes it to behave in an aggressive manner. So it's a native plant, but it doesn't necessarily represent a stable environment, at least not where it occurs in masses in monoculture. It behaves more like an exotic plant, a plant out of place. It's not the fault of the plant, it's just that the hydrology and the soil conditions have changed and created a, a situation 
that enables that species to run rampant. And there, there are those species, and I used to use this in a, as an example. This is, this is yarrow, Achillea millifolia. And I learned this plant as being non-native to the region. Um, Achillea refers to uh, the Greek um, myths of Achilles. Uh, Achilles was said to have used this plant, or one like it, in the same genus to treat the wounds of, uh, of uh, soldiers in his, uh, his army after battle. I could say that this, this plant has become naturalized. It's uh, very often found in stable, uh, intact native plant communities. Um, I think we'd be hard pressed to find a good prairie remnant in Southeast Wisconsin that didn't have some yarrow in it. But now botanists are actually starting to change their tune and they're saying that this may actually be a native species. It may actually have evolved here and not in the Mediterranean as previously thought. My point here is that there are non-native species that may be well behaved in the environment. So I'm not a purist when it comes to native versus non-native. I'm more interested in how well behaved a plant is, how suitable it is for its environment. And when I have a native plant available, I will definitely go that route. Uh, but not all non-native plants are necessarily uh, troubling in the environment. Ah, but native ours, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a sticky one. Essentially, anytime you see a plant label that may show a botanical binomial, it may show um, you know, a, a Latin name uh, of a plant you presume to be native to the region. If that label also includes uh, a name in quotations, you're dealing with a cultivar. So even if it is based on a native plant, uh, it may not be a true native. It may be a native cultivar or a native of. And these plants can be troubling because people assume that they are just the same as a native plant. And they may or may not provide the same kind of ecosystem services that true native species do. Here, for example, in the center photo, you've got um, Echinacea pallida, which is the pale purple cone flower. It is native to dry prairies uh, in this part of the country. It is a conservative plant um, that is very attractive and therefore has come under the careful scrutiny of breeders who would like to maximize certain uh, aspects of this flower. So surrounding the, the uh, photo in the center that is of the true species, you see a variety of native ours, uh, none of which are true native species, but are all based upon the purple cone flower. For example, the photo in the upper left is a nat native ours called Cheyenne Spirit. And you can see it's multicolored, uh, it, uh, you know, from yellows to reds, uh, you don't have the, the droopy, um, you know, ray petals widely spaced as you do in the true species. And the one in the lower left um, is monstrous. It's a double bloom. And this is, this is called Supreme Flamingo. And Again, these non-true native species are bred for visual components that may not serve the natural environment. There are very often fewer reproductive parts. You know, in the Echinacea true species, it's that cone, the, the disc flowers in the center that, um, that are reproductive, not these ray flowers that are sterile. Uh, in the double bloom, that's all you're getting are ray flowers. Uh, you're not getting any uh, reproductive parts. Uh, and you also don't get the same nectar production. So these plants are not necessarily feeding 
uh, the bees and the other pollinators that rely on our gardens to be able to uh, uh, make their way from one natural area to another. And also native artists tend to have uh, foliage that is less desirable to, um, to those that feed on the, the leaves. And insects do feed on vegetation. Uh, but when you have a native art that is selected for variegated foliage, you know, the patterning of pale and, and darker green or, um, you know, green and white, um, you don't always uh, get the uh, same nutritional value. Typically, the, the chlorophyll-laden portion of the leaf is a, a little more nutritious. Uh, and it may be that an insect has to work much harder to get the same caloric intake. And it's even worse when the native R is selected for these purple leaves, such as you see in this prunus um, cultivar, one of our cherry-based uh, uh, native R's. Uh, purple leaves contain a product called anthocyanin. And this is one of the, uh, one of the chemical products that um, uh, shows the, the fall colors uh, of our, our autumn leaves uh, as the chlorophyll uh, leaves the leaf, the anthocyanins and, and other compounds are exposed. But when they're front and center uh, and they're blocking the chlorophyll, uh, very often uh, insects are not interested in eating this. And you know, when I talk to gardeners and they say, well, you know, I want to plant a pollinator garden, but aren't the larvae of these insects going to be chewing on the leaves? Aren't they going to be defoliating my garden? And I really like what Gub Talamy said about that. He said, if you're concerned about the visual effect of these insects uh, eating the leaves, take 10 steps back and all your insect problems go away. So as if that's not enough, um, you know, people often try to do the right thing, but they, they go at it without, you know, all the information that they need to be, you know, well informed to, to make uh, what could otherwise be a difficult decision. So for example, um, people have planted this uh, exotic milkweed, Asclepius curasivica, and other such species, um, to support monarchs. And yet it has been found that some of these non-native species end up complicating the situation because they can support parasites that uh, are in fact hammering the monarch population. So it can actually do more harm than good to install some of these plants. Even though you think, well, it's milkweed, it must be good for monarchs. Um, it's really important that we try to do uh, our homework. So it's been found that introduced species can, can support only about one third the food value to insects that our native species do. That's a 67% drop in uh, the nutritional value, generally speaking, across species. And a study in the year 2017 found that only 25% of the stock in the wholesale nursery trade was native. We can do better, but it's gonna be up to us as consumers to be able to um, try to demand more from the growers. Um, when you think about it, native ours are contributing in many ways to what we're calling the insect apocalypse the loss of uh, insect populations, uh, the dramatic drop. Part of this is habitat loss and destruction. Part of it is uh, you know, non-native vegetation and native arts. And insects represent an essential strand in the food web. I mean, we may not like pest insects, but the fact of the matter is we need insects in the, in the natural environment and in the home landscape in order to be able to sustain those species that we really want to see. So the use of native plants in the landscape does not have to mean that you're um, planting a riot of uh, ill-behaved, rowdy weeds. 
you can combine um, different aesthetic um, styles uh, to the use of native plants in the landscape. You know, here you've got, you know, a nice curved border with a little bit of, you know, a finely kept lawn. Uh, you've got, you know, statuary bench. You've got a cyclone fence in the background, but you've also got, you know, masses of native plants that are providing blocks of color, uh, the various textures, the tall grass. Um, this looks like a formal garden, but it incorporates native stock. And, you know, here's a little less showy of a photo, but it just happens to be, a, you know, in the town where I live, you know, that someone has got Joe Pye weed in their front yard, they've got other native plants, and, uh, you know, they've really kind of taken their whole front yard and turned it into a native plant garden right up to the sidewalk. Here too, another example where the front yard uh, has been pretty well converted from lawn to perennial garden. Uh, most of it native, um, although I have to admit there are some native arms in there. I see a hydrangea and uh, the tree on the left is a catalpa that probably wasn't native right here, the arbor vitae next to the house, but still at all, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, oxeye sunflower and uh, black-eyed Susan, there's penstemon in there, and in this example, um, <clears throat> again, it's a blend of, you know, the, the formal fencing, uh, some hostas and lilies around the base of the tree, uh, but there's also a splash of native plants along the walkway, uh, and it's not all sterile law. So these halfway measures are beneficial. Um, <clears throat> could we take it further and go true natives all the way? Yeah, that's the next step. Um, but we don't have to get there all at once, you know, and depending on your setting, you know, in a suburban environment or an urban environment, um, you may have to contend with uh, weed ordinances of your municipality, uh, the, the downcast looks from your neighbors. Um, so much depends on set and setting. So, you have options. You can pick your palette, so to speak. You know, here, for example, on the left, you've got a block, <clears throat> a massing of um, Virginia bluebells, Hortensia virginica, uh, and you've got a nice solid stand there in the spring. Whereas the photo on the right, you've got a variety of textures. Um, there's cup plant and there's um, there are asters in there, there's a purple cone flower, uh, there's goldenrod in there, there's wing stem, uh, a wide variety of structure and texture. So on the left, you've got a patio border full of asters in the fall. And on the right, you've got a planting that goes right up against the house. And uh, the yellow flowers in bloom there in the spring are uh, golden alexanders, Zizia aurea. And in the lower left portion of that photograph, I can see uh, woodland sunflowers in the genus Helianthus. Uh, the two trees in the background, there's one on the right, it's an evergreen, it's the native uh, juniper, uh, the eastern red cedar. Uh, and the straight trunk on its left is, uh, is a, um, American elm, almost Americana. And again, note that the planting goes right up against the house. Uh, it's a stone facade, so you don't need to worry about, you know, the high humidity affecting, uh, you know, certain kinds of siding. Uh, you have a painted surface to have to maintain. So here the homeowner was able to take the native plants and put them right up against the building. So briefly, I want to talk about oaks, because no discussion of our native plants would be complete without mentioning our oak species. Um, oaks are our keystone species, meaning that they provide ecosystem support services uh, that far outweigh the sheer prevalence of the trees in the landscape. Um, Doug Tallamy, whom we've mentioned earlier and will again in this presentation, 
um, professor from, uh, from the East Coast, Delaware, I believe. Uh, he had conducted a study and he found that there were 534 species of butterflies and moths in the Lepidoptera, 534 species of these insects uh, that are supported by oak trees collectively. And that number is far higher than any other group of uh, trees or other plants uh, by a significant factor. And there's a photo of a yellow warbler there in the inset, and that's because the oaks provide a, a linchpin function in the food web and the migratory cycles. Because the oak leaves, when they emerge in the early spring, are soft and palatable. Uh, they have not yet acquired a buildup of tannins, the tannic acid that gives uh, the leaves and the acorns a bitter taste. Uh, the, the chemical product that allows us to tan leather to make it waterproof. So these tannins do not occur in, in great quantity when the leaves first emerge around the first or second week of May. Well, that happens to be the same time that a lot of these butterfly species, eggs hatch. The larvae emerge around that, that early part of May, and they begin to munch on these newly emerged leaves. Well, that happens to coincide with the arrival of migratory songbirds, such as the warblers. And these warblers, exhausted and hungry from their long flight from South America, uh, ravenously consume these caterpillars. Uh, and are subsequently able to also feed caterpillars to their young. Again, young birds need protein in order to grow. And uh, it's typically uh, insect larvae that provide that protein. So the oaks are at the root of our ecological function in this area. So here's a little oak tree in my backyard. Uh, and it was its first crop of acorns. This is a bur oak, uh, and the acorns emerged, I'm gonna say about 12 to 15 years after I first planted it. And I planted it as a five gallon um, potted uh, transplant. It was uh, perhaps waist high at the time with uh, a half inch diameter trunk. And uh, today, uh, some 20 years later, it's probably 30 feet tall. And uh, for people who think that oaks grow slowly, I would say, yeah, kind of. But they do enjoy a pretty good flourish of growth uh, when they get to, into that you know, waist high to head high range. Uh, my oak has put on you know, 12 to 15 inches of uh, terminal growth in a given year. So here again is that same little oak on the left. And I want to encourage people when they plant oaks or other native trees to not uh, have turf grass run right up against the trunk. Um, the oaks and the other trees, they want to have their familiar companions. They like to hang out with their friends. So around this little burr oak, I've got Carex sprengelii, the long-beaked sedge. Uh, there's common blue violet in there, uh, Viola sororia. Oh, there's also um, tall bellflower growing up in there. Um, the key is um, oaks are vigorous root growers in their early stages of life. And they're putting forth uh, roots that extend well beyond the drip line of the crown. So the oaks extend farther than the crown does. And most of the metabolic activity in the oak's roots are taking place within the first few inches of the surface of the soil. And that's a space that would otherwise be occupied by turf grass in a lawn. So in this case, if you want to give your oaks a good, healthy environment to flourish in, remove that turf grass from around uh, the area you planted, keep it free from turf grass and uh, instead install some other native plants that uh, normally associate with oaks. Now, usually the best way to clear an area uh, of, of uh, the turf is to simply smother it. 
So you can lay down cardboard or newspaper, soak it down, stake it, put a tarp over it, uh, and, and uh, just rob the sod of sunlight. It's a non-chemical way of doing it, and it doesn't disturb the soil strata. It doesn't disrupt the uh, microcosm of all the little organisms in the soil. So here again, uh, I had mentioned the Carex sprengelii, the, uh, the sedge. Uh, here's another sedge on the right. This is rosy sedge, Carex rosea, uh, a beautiful little star-like uh, fruiting structure. Uh, here it's growing with wing stem and Virginia creeper. Uh, on the left is a stand of silky wild rye uh, in my backyard. Uh, and if you look in the lower foreground of that photo, uh, that's a white oak. So I planted a white oak uh, in the backyard as well as the burr. And it's a smaller tree still. It's, it was planted much, much more recently, just a couple of years ago. Uh, so you can see the rye grasses uh, grow taller than the oak. Uh, but they grow well together. So companion gardening is a good thing. Remember that our, our, uh, our native plants grew up together and they like to hang out with uh, the Conservation at Home program is uh, one that uh, uh, encourages property owners to install and maintain native plants in their garden. Uh, I was part of administering that program in Lake County, Illinois, when I worked with a land trust there several years ago. Uh, and I participate as an enrollee in that program here in McHenry County, Illinois, where it's administered by the Land Conservancy of uh, McHenry County. In Walworth County, Wisconsin, uh, the program has just been introduced by, um, by our colleagues over at the Geneva Lake Conservancy. So participants um, are paid a visit by uh, master gardeners, master naturalists, or other ecologists, and are given some suggestions on how to manage stormwater, uh, where to install certain native plants, or how to remove or control the exotics or invasives. And uh, there's a scoring sheet. And properties that score uh, over a certain threshold are given a yard sign, such as uh, is being held here in the photograph. And it's simply a way of alerting your neighbors that, yeah, this is an intentional garden, and it's doing good for the environment. Uh, on the left side of the photo, there's a white oak. That's another tree that I planted there in the yard about 20 years ago, and it's now easily 35 feet tall and a good foot in diameter. So um, if you stick with the property long enough, uh, you can start trees from pencil size and still be able to enjoy them as full-grown trees. So now I'm going to shift out of the home uh, environment to, uh, to a couple of school projects. And this is a public grade school in Richmond, Illinois, just south of the state line, where a pollinator garden was installed uh, by a, a local uh, consultant and a Girl Scout troop. And it's being maintained by faculty at the school. And you can see that they've, they've planted carefully with uh, you know, arranged borders uh, there's a border of, of wood chips there along the driveway uh, to help define the space and keep the vegetation from, you know, hanging over the asphalt or, or being tempted to be whacked back by ground screws. And then here's another school project. This was in Johnsburg, and this, this was conducted under a grant. Um, and several partner organizations were engaged. The, the Friends of Hackmatech um, applied for and administered the grant. Uh, Small Waters Education, not-for-profit, provided uh, plant material and a um, certain amount of the site prep as well as the uh, planting design. True Nature Consulting provided uh, the rest of the site prep and training of the grounds crew in terms of maintaining the pollinator garden. And as part of the grant, uh, it was agreed that uh, the pollinator garden would be incorporated into the curriculum of the school. And this is a school that's uh, both a, a grade school and a middle school. So it, it, uh, it grades one through eight. And there are a couple of faculty 
um, champions who are using the pollinator garden as a teaching tool, uh, an outdoor classroom. Um, this is the design of the um, banner that was put up to, to uh, um, announce the project and to explain uh, the landscape changes we were making on the school grounds. Um, I think it's a beautiful piece of artwork, especially because uh, all of the plants and the insects that are depicted are in fact uh, accurate depictions of natives uh, to the region. Um, so it's not just in the home environment, it's not just uh, schools and churches. Uh, here's a public agency that has a wonderful native plant garden next to their visitor center. Uh, at uh, Glacial Park uh, of the McHenry County Conservation District. And there you can see they followed some of the traditional uh, guidelines where you've got the taller plants in the back. Uh, that's cup plant, which can be a little aggressive, so I'll warn you about that. Uh, the blue is uh, spiderwort, uh, the yellow is golden alexanders, uh, the white is fleabane, uh, there are grasses and sedges in there. I see compass plant off to the right. Uh, again, the taller structured things in the back, the showier things in the middle, shorter structure closer to the walkway. Now I mentioned a number of plant species by name and I know that a number of you are probably rolling your eyes when I say them because when I talk about golden alexanders or wing stem or cup plant, um, some of you may be thinking, well, yeah, those are native plants, but they're pretty aggressive in the garden. And you're absolutely right. Um, Golden Alexanders is shown here on the left, Zizia aurea. And on the right is a little bit more delicate or dainty uh, looking uh, species that is not dissimilar to Golden Alexanders in appearance. This is yellow pimpernel, uh, Tenadia integerima. And while the Zizia aurea is showier, it's also more aggressive. And the yellow pimpernel is less so. So if you're concerned about, you know, golden alexanders running rampant in your garden, consider an alternative. Now here's another opportunistic situation. This is tall bellflower, Campanulastrum americanum. And it's growing up through a crack in the pavement. You can see it's right next to this garage structure. And uh, the owner let it go and let it go to seed. And uh, that uh, plant is now appearing elsewhere around the garage, growing in, in more suitable habitat. So you can say that the plant is resourceful, it's resilient, it's opportunistic. Others might say it's aggressive, it's weedy. So again, it's all about context. And, you know, what you put where, um, you know, will have an effect on how much thinning and weeding you need to do later. So here's another one that tends to be a little bit uh, aggressive in the landscape. Herbicina, alternifolia, wing stem. Um, it may be aggressive, but the bumblebees adore this plant. And they are working those flowers day in and day out, later in the summer. Um, so what I do with this in my garden is I let it bloom. And then when the, when the bloom season is coming to an end, before the seeds ripen, I knock the heads off. And either I collect them and, and uh, mulch them, and, um, or I just you know um, leave them on the ground if they're not going to ripen. But uh, removing the seeds so that it doesn't self-seed is, is probably a good way to go. Um, the stems are pretty tough, so um, composting them is a little bit difficult. They decay slowly, but that certainly can be done if you've got a good compost situation going. Okay, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention our native shrubs. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. We can do a whole program on that. But uh, here is an autumn view of service berry. And I, I bring up, you know, Amelanchier, Levis, 
uh, or Emma Lanker Kennedensis if you're not a purist, um, because they're beautiful and they have four season interest. You, know, you can see the kind of fall color you get from it here. Uh, you'll notice the, the stems, uh, the trunks are smooth. And uh, if you've got a close up look, um, they have um, dark striations on them. So the, the stems give you beautiful winter interest. In the spring, they bloom white. Uh, they're in the rose family, so they have the five white petals, uh, similar to, to cherries or rose, uh, I'm sorry, um, apples. But the petals are strap-like. They're dainty, they're long and thin. And then this time of year, right now, they're bearing fruit. And the fruit is perfectly edible. Uh, it's good bird uh, forage, and uh, people like them too. You can use them much the way you would blueberries. All right, so we're going to summarize a little bit. Native plants do matter. And again, you can look at the landscape here, and you can see that this is comfortable and inviting kind of environment where the garden is occupied by native species. So where we have lost habitat, where our community sites are fragmented, um, where native islands of native species are, are separated from one another, um, the more we can introduce native plants back into the landscape, the more that we can knit together the natural areas that we value so well. So we can provide a little bit of additional diversity here in our own home landscape, and, you know, perhaps in our, our neighborhood churches or schools, even businesses, corporate campuses. And again, our connection to nature is fostered through these plants. And really, that helps to sustain us, recognizing that we are part of a community. And through the act of gardening, again, we are co-creators. We are working with nature and not fighting against her. And the rewards of that are more than we can count. So a little recap on the, the risks posed by using native bars. If you're going to plant native bars, do so cautiously. Be well aware of what you're doing. And recognize that it is the true species, the wild species, that will provide the highest function and the highest ecological value in your garden. If you're going to go with a native bar, try to avoid those that have the changed leaf color. Again, you don't need a purple plum. Uh, and then consider trying open pollinated native bars, not only those that uh, are not those that reproduce only vegetatively. And again, only use a native bar if that's the only alternative, if you're not able to find the true native. So talk about this. Ask your local grower, ask your neighbor, you know. Um, you want to know, you want some assurance that it's a true native. You also want to know, you know, how the grower propagated it, you know, was it collected ethically, you know, you don't want to be planting stuff that was poached from, from a, a protected natural area. So the native bars are not going to support as diverse a population of insects. And it's up to us to support the nurseries that provide the native stock. And then finally, do talk to your neighbors, uh, members of Wild Ones and others, uh, and share sources. If you've got a reputable grower, a good source of native stock, whether it's seed or potted plant, um, share that and support uh, those local businesses. So yes, choose the, the true species if you can, encourage cross-pollination, Propagate from seed rather than removing a plant from the wild, that's possible. Uh, share your seeds uh, with like-minded gardeners. Um, share your cuttings. Uh, if you need to thin something or move something from your garden, see if you can find it a good home. There are a lot of people that are looking to establish a native plant garden. And then again, encourage 
any retail outlet or any grower that you do business with or have contact with. Encourage them to offer the true species and where they cannot or, or will not, please encourage them to label the product truthfully and carefully. And for those of you who may not have a clear view of the screen, I'm gonna go ahead and read this quotation again from Doug Tallamy from the University of Delaware. He says, it is a bad idea to load the landscape with cultivars that have no genetic variability. I would go that route only if it is a choice between a native R and a plant from China. I think the safest policy right now is to encourage the use of straight species. Ask for them at your local nursery. And encouraging nurserymen to start stocking more straight species. The nursery, and nursery industry has not embraced the message that native plants are more about ecosystem function than about looks. We have to convince them that there is a market for plants with high function. I like that sentence. And my little uh, catchphrase, diversity is a hedge against adversity. So with that, I want to thank you all very much for being part of this program. Um, you go ahead and bring up the, uh, the grid view and I'm going to close with one other comment about whether a plant is native or whether it's quote from China. You know, this isn't meant to be a nationalist rant. It's not, it doesn't matter to me whether a plant is from China or if it's from Mexico or if it's from California. If it's not from the upper Midwest, that's where I'm concerned that it's not native. And you know, this isn't, to my view, about being a purist, because in my own garden, and you saw some photos in my garden, there are non-native plants. There are native ones. I will also admit that those plants were put there either by a prior owner or my ex-wife, and I haven't gotten around to removing all of the non-native stock. Um, instead, you know, I know that um, the garden flocks, for example, is frequently visited by hummingbirds, by hummingbird moths, by bumblebees. It seems to be functioning within the garden, within the ecosystem. So again, my personal approach is, is one uh, of not being a purist, but of welcoming well-behaved participants to, uh, to the garden. And I'm going to unmute everybody. So if you've got any questions, we have a few minutes. Greg, we did have one question. Is it an acceptable practice to collect seeds from public natural areas? Typically, no. Um, if it's public, it is probably protected. One can collect seed from those areas if one obtains a permit to do so. So it depends on the jurisdiction, it depends on who owns that particular property. Um, <clears throat> I volunteer as a seed collector uh, for various agencies, um, whether it's the DNR or McHenry County or on county parks property or, or our own preserves. And, you know, typically, that kind of work is undertaken either under supervision in a group uh, and the seed is given to the agency. Um, but there may be uh, provisions for sharing a portion of the harvest with those who volunteer. Um, certain um, individuals may you know, seek a permit uh, under certain circumstances where they're allowed to go out and, and harvest on their own. Um, it really depends on the property owner. Ethically, if you're gonna do seed collection, there are a couple of things to remember. And one is not to over collect. You know, if you're dealing with an annual plant, don't take more than 10% of the, of the seed. 
Uh, if it's a, a perennial plant, you might be able to get away with 50%. That would be at the high end. Uh, again, there will be guidelines in place according to the property owning agency or organization or individual owner. And if you're curious about seed collection, I could do a similar Zoom presentation on seed collection maybe later in the year. Charlene? Well, first of all, I want to thank you. This was really, really an interesting seminar. I want to thank you for putting it on. But I also wanted to tell you that I participated in the Conservation at Home program here in uh, Lake Geneva. And it was um, very interesting. And I had a couple people come out and assess my little postage stamp yard. So I got my conservation at home sign, which I will be displaying soon. Congratulations. Yeah. Can I? So, where, how did you get that? I'm just starting and I want the same thing. So where did you get this done? I didn't well, understand. You, you need to contact the Lake Geneva Conservancy. Okay. And uh, make an appointment and they will come out. Free of charge. That would be wonderful because I'm so confused. <laughs> but I want, you know. Yes, Geneva Lake, Geneva Lake Conservancy is using a couple of volunteers who are master gardeners and they are conducting the site visits. Um, I can't speak to direct experience with Geneva Lake Conservancy, but I know that when I did site visits with Conserve Lake County, they would typically take an hour to an hour and a half and, um, you know, we would try to leave the property owner with a checklist of items that, uh, you know, they might want to work on or include. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think it was on a five year revisit cycle. So if you wanted to renew your certification uh, under the Conservation at Home program, uh, you would uh, be visited again in five years to make sure that it was still uh, in reasonable shape. The program was begun by a land trust in Naperville, Illinois, the Conservation mm -hmm. Foundation. So you can get more information from the Conservation Foundation or uh, Geneva Lake Conservancy. And they, actually, we're going to be posting some information on the City of Lake Geneva website as well. Good. So we're going to try to get as many people in our city involved as possible. That's great. You know, like I said early on in the presentation, if we've got a little post stamp yard and we've converted it to a native plant garden, that's wonderful. But if it's the only such garden in a 10 mile radius, it's not going to provide the kind of services that we could achieve if we did have that archipelago, that string of pearls, that opportunity for a monarch butterfly or a bumblebee to go a few yards down or two blocks over and find another haven. In my area, I do see something, but I'm not sure if they are exactly correct, but I know they've got a lot of the flowers you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask uh, the last person who spoke, we didn't catch your name because you show up as a telephone number. So I know. I couldn't get my computer to do it, so and I didn't see any of the pictures. Disappointed. But this is Mary Weber, and I live in Oconomowoc. Okay. Well, thank you, Mary, and, and welcome. Um, Mary Jo has a question, apparently. Are there places we can look for sample ordinances to move city, our city, Lake Geneva specifically, in that direction and or ways to set up recognition programs within areas so that people are encouraged by that recognition? Well, I might refer that question to Mariette if she's still on the line with us, um, because I think Wild Ones may have some uh, resource information on model ordinances and that type of thing.
And it looks like we might have lost Mariette. So I would ask that you perhaps follow up with Wild Ones. And then if uh, anyone outside the you know, Geneva Lake uh, area would be interested in setting up a conservation at home program locally, um, you can contact the um, Conservation Foundation because they essentially invented the program and they franchise it out. Um, so um, I have a question. Will this video be available online, this seminar at all? We'll make it available. Uh, it's a link. Right now it exists on the cloud and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do to share it. Um, we have not yet determined exactly how to do so, whether we're going to set up a YouTube channel or a page on our website or keep it on the cloud. Um, but if you're interested in the program and you want the link, just let Sue know and we'll, we'll make it happen. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, and with that, I think I'll stop recording.